Okay, so the first thing we want to do is um, go to tendermint.com. Oh, by the way, just uh, to get a feeling for who's in the audience uh, or who's here, how many of you are developers? Right, that's almost everyone. How many of you have installed any of the like Tendermint, Ethermint, or Basecoin binaries? All right, cool. That's actually good. Um, so in the, initially, I tried to get everyone to install Go and install from source. That turned out was to be a terrible idea. So we will use binaries this time around. Um, so let's see. Yeah. If you go to Tendermint. Yeah. Dot com and then click on download. Please download uh, Tendermint and Basecoin and also Ethermint. If you guys want to join in, it's totally still fine. We're just downloading some binaries now. Nice. That's what I like to hear. Uh, yes. Has everyone started to download these binaries? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so, Norm, uh, let's just share the desktop. desktop. Yes. Uh, so only they just open the folder that they're in. And then in the terminal, well, if you know what you're doing, just move them into your path. Uh, if not, just follow me. Navigate anywhere within the terminal, drag and drop the binary from the folder after you've unzipped it, and move it into user local bin. And for Basecoin, when you unzip the Basecoin zip file, you get two binaries, Basecoin and Base CLI. Please move both of them into your path. Um, after we have installed them, I'll give you a brief overview. Um, and if you're also installing Ethermint, Please note that these are still the outdated binaries. Um, so they will unzip to something Ethermin minus AMD64. Uh, when you move them, please rename them just to Ethermin. Otherwise, we'll have trouble on late, trouble later on. Uh, so I can actually show you. Wait, do you have Ethermin download? No. So if we download this. Let's see, downloads. And just give me a heads up once you've installed those binaries and and you are able to run ether um tendermint version. So if you see like proper output here, you're good to go. And the same for base coin. And the same for base CLI. We need to open up all of them? Uh, no, just uh, to test. And yeah, for Ethermint, when you unzip it, um, you get this kind of oddly named binary. Uh, when you move it into your path, just rename it. Ethermint. Uh, uh, and move it into user local bin ethermint. Yeah. Right. Cool. Everyone there? Okay, this is going to be very different than the previous group, I think, because this worked way better. Um, Okay, uh, now let's jump here. Yes. 
Uh, yeah, so I'm from Tendermint, if you have not realized by now. Um, that's me. And I'll send these slides around afterwards as well, so you can reach me with questions. Um, just a bunch. So actually, interesting enough, have any of you used any of the test nets for Basecoin or Ethermint? Uh, so Basecoin offers you this kind of interoperable test net where you can send money between two separate blockchains. And Ethermint offers you highly scalable Ethereum smart contracts at like two, 20 times the speed of normal Ethereum in terms of transaction throughput. All right, no one, good. So no coins. Yeah, that's our team so far. So we're slightly more people. I think we're 15 people by now. Um, we're hiring a bunch all the time. Um, yeah, that's what I do. I talked about it yesterday. So what I mostly do is I work with Tenement Core, Ethermin, which is our kind of go Ethereum, um, peg zones. So how do we move value from Ethereum and Bitcoin into the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Rust programming language, so I do I uh, support the language, Rust language bindings, and if you don't know Rust, I would totally check it out. Um, and I work a bit on enterprise integrations and develop outreach. Um, right, let's go here. Okay, so what is Tenement? Tenement, um, or well, when you look at traditional blockchains like Bitcoin, it's a very monolithic stack. So you have the consensus layer somewhere in there, you have the peer layer somewhere in there, and you have the application logic somewhere in there as well. But it's all kind of mixed together. And what the most recent blockchains have started doing is they're kind of pulling the stack apart. So Tenement itself actually has no application logic, absolutely nothing. So Tenement does no cool, cool thing that users can actually play with. Um, because that all happens within the application. What Tenement does, is it provides you global ordering of transactions. So it's literally just a blockchain. It doesn't say what you should do with those transactions. It just says this is the global order for this blockchain of these transactions. And what happens when you run Tenement? So Tenement is this yellow, is all the yellow part. So a client or, yeah, so let's say you have Tenement instance running locally on your computer and you submit a transaction to it. So you do that over JSON RPC and you just send it um, an encoded message. So you send it a bunch of bytes, essentially. Um, Tenement receives this and stores it in something called the mempool. And at that stage, Tenement still doesn't know, is this a valid transaction? Is this an invalid transaction? So it goes and asks the application. So, and we might get to writing like a tiny application, we might not. But this is what developers, what people that want to build on top of Tenement actually implement. They only write the application logic. They don't have to worry about peer, peer consensus there. So Tenement goes and says, I have this transaction. Please tell me, is this a valid transaction? If it's a valid transaction, respond with a yes. If it's not a valid transaction, respond with a no. If it's not a valid transaction, Tenement will just discard the transaction and ignore everything around it. If it is a valid transaction, Tenement will now start gossiping this transaction to all the connected peers. So because we are a global connected blockchain network, all our peers should hear about um, transactions that we have received ourselves, right? And here, the most important thing is that when Tenement does the check TX, that's the message type, it should not update any sort of state within your application. And just to clarify also what the application actually does, so the application does the entire business logic and persistence there. Um, so this is kind of, if you think about it in terms of Ethereum or Bitcoin, in terms of Bitcoin, this, is kind of, this implements the UTXO model. In terms of Ethereum, this implements the account logic and the account model and actually saving it to disk. But if it's a valid transaction, we've started gossiping around, eventually we come around to, we want to produce a block now. So Tenement goes and says, right, let's take a bunch of transactions, let's say 100, and it doesn't actually produce a block, or it doesn't produce a block immediately. It first takes this list of 100 transactions, and that, okay, so also there are, instead of having miners, you have validators. And validators get chosen to produce a block randomly, essentially. And so let's say we have 100 validators in the network, 100 of these validators will randomly pick one, and then this is the next block producer. So this block producer goes and says, give me 100 transactions, I order them for you. And then this uh, producer 
starts agreeing with the rest of the network, so it gets consensus from the rest of the network on this is going to be the next block. Once more than two thirds of the network agree on this next block, we actually create a new block. So this is important, right? Because the network agrees before we actually produce the block. So it means once we have produced the block, everyone in the network already agrees on it and we will not reorder it. So there's not the case as of Ethereum where you have to wait six turns six blocks until you can be certain that you're on the longest chain. It's if you transact if your transaction is in a block, it's in the longest chain by default. There are some edge cases where you have massive attacks against the network, of course, but these are handled differently out of out of band and not within the core protocol. So, sorry, so do you use some sort of consensus algorithm for the whole of the network to agree on something, or is it like some chosen? Uh, yeah, so the way that they agree on which block is the next one, that's the tenement consensus, so BFT. Okay. And does everyone participate in that consensus, or is it uh, like a substance? Um, so all the 100 validators, right? So okay. there's the difference between you're either a validating node or a non-validating node. So every full node is by default a non-validating node unless you're within the validator set, at which point you now have the privilege and the obligation to make sure that the network is secure. And in enterprise um, applications, these 100 validators are fully known and like, for example, in Office. So we don't have this problem of that they have to provide some sort of security. In the public Cosmos Hub, this is done by the fact that if you're a validator, you have to put up a security deposit. And if you fuck up by double signing, you lose that security deposit. So you lose real economic value if you start misbehaving. Um, yeah, and so then the last step essentially here is that once you have those 100 transactions and we've agreed on the order of those 100 transactions, Tenement goes and takes the first transaction and says, app, application, here's the first transaction, please run the transaction, change the state of the underlying database of the underlying persistence layer, and then it does that 100 times, let's say. And then afterwards, Tenman goes, right, This is these are all the transactions. This is, uh, then it sends an end block message. And on the end block message, the application has to respond with the root hash. So one hash that represents the entire state at that state. Um, so when you come from Ethereum, this would be like a Merkle root hash that represents the entire underlying data structure, the entire, uh, entire underlying persistence layer into one value. And then this one value is included in the block. And that's how Tenement starts creating blocks. Questions on this? So it's the Merkle roots of the whole state, not just the block. Yeah. So it includes the historic state as well. Uh, for now, it is of the entire state. Um, but of course, we're always playing around with different designs, and we might yeah. change that. Uh, was there something else? Oh, yeah. um, right. Um, if you actually, so if you're a real developer and you want to work on this, I recommend that you install it from source. For that, you need Go. So all this is written in Go. It's surprisingly short, actually. It's like 25,000 lines of Go code. It's not necessarily easy Go code, but it's only 25,000 lines. So it's very manageable to get into the code base. Um, and so, yeah, the first thing, let me share a different. I just quickly ask, why do guys choose Go and yeah. what benefits do you yeah. Yeah. Um, The original implementers like Go, and yeah. they wrote the beginning in Go. Right. And Go. I, I never used Go, so I'm just curious. Right. No, I mean, so you could. I, so in the Ethereum community, or in the blockchain community, it very much seems that the old guard implements everything in C, looking at Monero and Bitcoin. Um, and then Ethereum started using Go, and then Parity started using Rust. So it's like really Rust or Go are the two modern languages, and Go is just way easier to learn. I highly recommend Go to everyone as well. Mm. Okay, and so the demo we're going to do involves sending some money, right? It's a blockchain, it stores value. And the cool thing about this proof of stake implementation is that it can build very efficient light clients. So, with a Ethereum or Bitcoin or generally any proof of work blockchain, the problem always becomes what happens if a user doesn't want to run a full node? And most users, if you want to scale this to the world, will not want to run a full node because it's a huge uh, cost 
even to run a non-validating node. And if you then want to have a light client, for example, for Ethereum, you at least need to keep up with all the headers. In case of Bitcoin, you probably also need to keep up with all the blocks. So you have a huge communication overhead in terms of if you want to run on a phone, for example, build a banking application, mobile application on top of it. But with, uh, with Tendermint, you can write very efficient light clients because, as I mentioned before, the public network will have 100 validators. And as long as you know the hash of all the public keys of those 100 validators, that's the only thing you have to trust for a light client. And as long as you get this trusted hash once, all future transactions with the network are fully secure. It doesn't matter whether your connection is compromised. It doesn't matter whether there's a man in the middle attack. All the transactions that you do within the chain are fully secure, even though you don't have to keep up with all the state and all the blocks and all the transactions of the chain. So with, um, with the Cosmos Hub, we are targeting this kind of interoperability. So you have a central hub, and then you have zones around it. And these zones in the central hub are light clients to each other, so that they keep up once in a while with the um, state changes happening on the other zones. That means that, for example, if I ha we have two testnets right now. Actually, we have three, but two base con testnets that support this inter-blockchain communication. So we have Kami's and Mercury. And what you can do is you have one blockchain called Kami's, and you can send money from Kami's to Mercury in a completely secure way. And now you can imagine once we once this scales and people start building their own applications on top of this, they're all plugging the same Cosmos hub, where we can all have transactions running in between those different zones. Zones, so we kind of completely different chains that fulfill different niches, but they can all somehow still talk to each other and update each other on the kind of money they have or where the money moves. And that's what we're going to do today. It's a very simple demo. It literally just involves me sending you some money and then you sending some money around. Um, so could everyone make sure that you can run base CLI and get output, and that you can run base coin? and also get output. And then let's start with the first thing. Okay, we have to download a bunch of files, so bear with me. Um, uh, have, have any of you used the testnet before? Okay, perfect. Then we're not overriding any data. Uh, so the first command is you set a local environment variable. Is anyone on Windows as well? Thank God. Because I have no idea how this works on Windows. Um, I'll post it into the GitHub Slack as well. Okay, and then the next command is just downloading a bunch of initialization files from GitHub. And I'm not going to do this because I already have those files. By the way, if you're a step behind, please let me know and we can all catch up. Uh, that should be fine. Right, unless the git clone command fails for you. But normally it should create the folder automatically. And then the next thing is, once you've downloaded the files from Git, navigate into the folder. Everyone there? Perfect. Um, so we have to run uh, a short script that I will just show you right now. Um, so in this script, we're just setting a bunch of environment variables. Uh, it's probably not good from a security perspective to run unverified scripts on your machine, um, but this should be okay. <laughs> Haven't had any problems with it so far. Um, yeah, so if we just run sorry, source scripts testnet sh. Also, all, so it sets up a bunch of environment variables, but they're all local to the shell session you're in. So if you want to 
rerun this at a later point. Just run the sort of the testnet dash setup dot sh file again, and just say no for everything so you don't overwrite your configuration. Let's find the right comment for you. Okay, there we go. The next command is now, now we want to initialize um, our light time. And yeah, this is correct. So we have seven, seven validating nodes running in, I think, three or four different data centers around the world. And of course, right now, we as a company control the entire testnet, which isn't going to be the case for the public actual version of the testnet even. So in about a month or so, we will start allowing the first community members to also run their own validating nodes, just to test whether the interaction actually works properly. But for now, you're essentially saying, I have this light time on and this minus Hermes is essentially just an alias for data directory. Because every single, um, every chain has its own directory where it stores its data. So he was saying, run the base, uh, base CLI for the Hermes chain, Hermes chain initialize it um, to this test set, uh, to, to communicate with this node. And importantly, it doesn't matter whether you trust this node or not. It is still okay as long as you can verify one piece of information and give it the correct chain ID. And once you've done this, just change Mer Hermes to Mercury uh, in every single place. Mercury. So to get a VCLI Hermes command, what should I have done? Just run the script, the source script. Oh, right. It sets up the base CLI minus Hermes. Alias. Oh, yeah, you also have to change the URL. Yeah, so um, also update the URL from Hermes to Mercury. Then just say yes, that's valid. Yeah, so the validator hash, that's the only thing you have to trust. If this is fake and it's not the correct validator hash, then everything else is completely insecure and your money will get stolen. Um, it's very much like the initial genesis file for proof of work blockchains. And it, that's the, the only thing you actually have to trust. Um, so I've run this before as well, so this should work for me too. Very Right, so now we have to create our first uh, private key. And for this, I can just show you how it looks. So I have one private key called Adrian. If you want to create your own private key, um, just say new. And after new, now you have to type a name. You can pick any name you want. And I'm sorry, but you do have to pick a password, and it has to be like eight characters. For example, if I say new demo, not 10 characters. So yeah, pick a standard password. All right, and the cool thing is, so you have the standard, I mean, not both. You get the freight, uh, seed words to even restore your keys. I don't think we currently support actually restoring your keys, but this will come eventually as well. Okay, um, keys list, so let's see my key. Oh. This key has some money. <coughs> uh, query account. 
Um, and yeah, so now we can run, once you have your own private key and the address of that key, you can run base CLI, Mercury, query account, and then the name or the address. This will not give you any output because you haven't had any money yet or you don't have any money in your yet. But here also the important thing is, so we see the block height. So the tenement network produces about roughly one block a second. And the problem right now, or the problem or one of the pitfalls right now is that even empty blocks being, are being produced. Uh, so even if you have a very low transaction uh, volume chain, you're still generating a lot of um, useless data because every block is about, I think, 15 bytes or so. So you're filling up a database quite a bit. But, and this is also one of the problems why we can't really in a demo run like sync up to a network because syncing up to a network takes by now like a day. Um, so we're working on faster fasting implementation. And next month in the next release, we're also taking out the empty blocks. So if there's no transaction going on, we don't actually produce blocks. Um, so yeah, there's constant improvement. Also, as you can see, you have a sequence number, which just uh, prevents you normal replay attacks. And as you might have noticed, so I have like a bunch of different cryptocurrencies, right? And this is what Basecoin really is. It's a multi-cryptocurrency ledger. And it will be the basic book where, where the Cosmos Sub stores how much of each currency each zone has. Um, so since you can plug in an arbitrary zone with an arbitrary token, you can, the Cosmos Hub itself with Basecoin can also store for each zone token. Okay, so now if you post your address in the channel, in the Gitter, I can actually send you some money. So I have this money available. So slightly low and awesome. <laughs> Maybe not one of each because it's like four separate transactions I have to type. So what was the which list there? Oh, uh, uh, base CLI Mercury keys list. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, so I have this kind of money, and we can now play around, and I'll continue some. Uh, so, which ones do you want? All right, let's start with the draw. Well, actually, our um, base CLI Mercury TX and I do TXN. <coughs> okay, so with a name keyword, uh, with a name flag, you have to specify which private key you're coming, uh, which private key you're sending from. And with the amount, you have to specify which currency you're sending and how much of it. And then you also have to specify who you're sending it to. And most importantly, you have to specify an always increasing sequence number. And as you can see, so this takes a while, or this takes like two or three seconds to do, because this actually goes out to the node and submits it to the node. But again, it doesn't matter whether the node tries to cheat you or not, you can always discover whether it tries to cheat you. What do you have to manually specify the sequence? Uh, in the future, we might remove that. For now, it no, just. I know uh, there's no security around. I think we're also moving towards randomizing the the sequence numbers. So, but uh, so I have to say also, I'm not directly working on, with Basecoin that much, so I'm mostly focused yeah. on the Ethereum integration. So this is also quite interesting to me. Uh, oh yeah, so that's the um, in the GitHub channel. Um, so this is your key. Oh, the, the command is. Uh, yeah. No, it's base CLI dash Mercury keys list. And then just post this address in the public <coughs> channel. And I'll just dish out some money to some of you so you can send money in between as well. And after a while, 17.
Uh, George, what kind of currency would you like? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Okay, then you're getting like 10,000 XE. 10,000 XE. Oh shit, I'm running out of power. Um, okay, I'm also sending some to Steven. Steven, which one would you like? Uh, the X is fine. The X is fine. <laughs> Guys, you can go for the, the really valuable and rare ones. Oh, also, there's a small bounty. Um, so there's a huge security flaw on this right now, which isn't obvious from the demo, but if you actually look into the documentation, you might be able to figure out how to create an arbitrary amount of money. We discovered, and this isn't going to be live for much longer, but uh, since you're upgrading the testnet, but until then, you can create any amount of money you want. Oh, sorry, what happens if you don't specify and implement the secrets one? Uh, we can try that. Oh, oh, yeah, duplicate transaction, right? This doesn't work either. <coughs> yeah, you just get an error here. Invalid sequence, sequence number. Uh, OK, Andreas, what kind of points would you like? You might be the last one to be getting candles and running low. I need to create more arbitrary money. How many candles do I have? I'm getting right now about 50 pennies. Okay, and wait, what? Oh, wait. Uh, I only have 11 pandas left. And yeah, so the way you check whether you actually got the money is by saying base CLI Mercury uh, query account and then your account address. Uh, so in an ideal scenario, you kind of want to um, export environment variables saying, for example, the U equals this. So you don't have to type your keys all the time. Okay, um, so now that we actually have money, we can also send it between blockchains. And again, this from for now, this doesn't look really interesting because it's still a CLI and no user interface on top of it. And you, really, and you can't really see the use case, but the fact that you can have two totally separate blockchains that can communicate and share value between each other through, through a central hub. And by central, I don't mean you have to trust this hub and it's only this hub. Um, you can spin up your own hub. <coughs> and as long as enough people join this one hub, you can still transact with them. So for example, one model could be that every city in the UK runs their own local blockchain so that you have transactions with a London being on the same zone and transactions with a Manchester being on the same zone. And once... And to actually transact between London and Manchester, you have um, a hub for the UK. So you have one hub for the UK where all the UK transactions come together. Sorry, how does a hub look like? Um, the hub is essentially just one extra blockchain which keeps track of it. Or in this case, it's just a relay station just because we have only two blockchains. Okay. Um, and then you could also, of course, have that Germany does the same concept for all, their city, all its cities. And Denmark does the same thing. And then you can have one European hub where all the different hubs communicate with. So it's kind of cascading down very much like the internet topology that you have this kind of backbone communication protocol being TCP IP and you have servers in between that you can actually talk to. Yeah, and so has anyone managed to uh, set it up a key on, not Mercury, but on Hermes. Uh, keys list. Okay. Do I have money in this key base CLI? Hermes query account. And if you haven't set one up, you can do so now. Now. Okay, we also uh, money. Uh, we did fix this by now as well. So uh, please do play um, with the test nets. Um, 
If you find bugs, there are bounties around. So if you find bugs, just let us know and we'll fix them. Uh, yes, so just keys, new, and then the name. And then, of course, a passphrase. And back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to send money between blockchains. So I'm sending from Mercury. So I'm transacting initially with the Mercury blockchain. Adrian amount, say 50 Axie. So now I have some. And I want to send two Hermes. But now I need a key that I'm sending two on Hermes. All right, so I'll post a key for Hermes. Let's try this. And I really hope this works now. Um, does anyone remember my last sequence number? It's like 18. No, it wasn't 18. Yeah, and now you should be able to check on, well, we can actually check here. Base CLI Hermes query account. Yeah, and now you receive money across blockchains. Again, this doesn't look fantastic, but it kind of would allow you to move money between Bitcoin and Ethereum and back from Ethereum to Bitcoin. So what happens exactly when you now send to um, So there is a relay in between um, that sees the transactions on Mercury yeah. and then relays those transactions to Hermes, where then Hermes checks whether it's a valid transaction or not. So once you commit it to a block, then this. Uh, well, the relays are listening on the blockchain, and so okay. anyone can run a relay for now. But we. No, you only send it to the validator, or you submit it to the blockchain. Yep. Yeah. And then the relay is listening in on the blockchain. And then picks up the transaction. That's is that before the consensus graph is reached? That is after the consensus. So okay. it checks whether you have money on the chain. And if it you have money on the chain, you get included in the block. And then the relay picks up the transactions okay. and then sends the transaction onto the next chain. Um, but again, so this is still an area which we are still actively working on. So we still don't have full specification for exactly the IBC protocol. Oh, well, no, we do have a Vacation, which is not super readable right now. Um, I can post the link so um, you can find some more information on how IBC actually works here. Um, let's go. So, down here on the base coin guide, you can find out more information on IBC. Um, and it's the same kind of thing that that a chain has to implement in the blockchain, the inter blockchain communication protocol, and then it's fully compatible with the, all the other chains. So currently we're working on, or I'm working on upgrading Ethermin to also include this IBC protocol, so that by the end of next month or so, hopefully actually earlier, so at the beginning of next month, we should be able to send actual fake Ether or Ethermint tokens from Ethermint to Basecoin as well. And then from Basecoin, you should be able to send uh, Ethermint tokens back to Ethermint. And uh, I think this will be the first actual like, real test that we can work between completely different blockchains. So Basecoin is an application, right? That has to be uh, running supported on both blockchains. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Bitcoin and Ethereum are kind of the screen box here. Okay, right. And yeah, so we have this is actually a cool thing because here, um, any of you, if you're a developer, you can pick up your favorite language. It doesn't have to be supported by any of our technology because this bridge in between its three uh, socket connections, and that's all there is. So as long as your language supports socket connections, you can interface with Tenant and Core. And hence, you can implement your blockchain in ten, uh, on top of Tenement. So, if you want to go out tomorrow and build your own 
next big Bitcoin, you don't have to worry about implementing this whole peer to peer or consensus layer because this is given to you and you only have to focus on actually making your application usable and then you provide real value to people there. Yeah. So you also have to make the applications consistent on both options, like if there's a version mismatch for the application. Yeah. So you have to also ensure, well, you either have to ensure that you can up, that um, different versions of your app are compatible with each other, or you, so initially you return, um, when you start up, um, Tenement has to figure out what kind of application it's running against. So it calls the info message, and in info you have to return some information. Um, and there you can make sure that you don't use different versions of the app if they're not compatible. Cool, that's just really nice. Um, also, I would urge everyone to try an Ethermin. Ethermin is really awesome. It supports all the Go Ethereum tooling, but at like 200 transactions a second. Um, and we also have a public testing called Ethermin. Sadly, we don't have a light client for that yet. Um, also working on that. So, but if you want to run Ethereum, but in a fast way, on maybe a less wasteful consensus algorithm, try Ethermin. Could you tell us? Oh, us getting, for Ethan? I guess I've downloaded binary. I just need power for that. Um, so, depending on which guide, so we have some old guides out there that still tell you to run Ethermint as, as, as a standalone thing. So, initially, what a lot of the people did was they kind of combined it all into the same binary. So, it's all written in Go, right? So, they kind of Compile Tenement and Ethermint and the application into the same binary, which reduced the overhead for the connections, but made it again very messy. Um, so nowadays you have to run Tenement separately from Ethermint. So to get started with this, um, let's show me go to Tmux. Um, and then let's split this. Scale. Let's see if I still have Ethermint files. Okay, I should have an Ethermint. All right, let's just do it like this. Um, so Ethermint and all right. Um, so with Ethermint, of course, with Ethereum, you have to give it a genesis state. Um, so I would just recommend using the Genesis file from the rep repository, which is Tenement Ethermint. And yeah, if you're not familiar with Go, this might look super weird, but Go is super anal about the path where um, the, the source files live. So everything has to live under Go. the source path, source, GitHub, Tenement, Ethermint. And if you want to use Go, please install something like Go version manager to make this your life way easier. To check out develop. Okay, and now we want to initialize Ethermint. Um, so we want to give a new home variable, so um, where Ethermint stores its files. Uh, let's just go Ethermint demo. Init def genesis. All right, let's uh, set up genesis JSON. All right, also this flag since. We want it to be as compatible with Ethermint, with Ethereum. These flags are not exactly the same as for Basecoin. So instead of home, it's data dear. Now we've initialized Ethermint and go Ethereum. What we now want to do is we also want to initialize Tenement. In Tenement, we also give it a home directory. And ideally, to make it easy, easy and keep track of where the files are, I would just put it into the base folder of Ethermint. So in my case, the data directory for Ethermint is in Ethermint minus demo. So I'm going to put my Tenement instance that is supporting Ethermint into the base folder slash Tenement. All right, um, I need to give it in. So now Tenement initialized everything it needs, like private validator keys, to be able to produce blocks. Um, <laughs> demo no. Um, now we're starting Tenement. 
and hopefully, even though this is life, it works. Um, what we also need to do is uh, implement comes with, in the Genesis file, there are two set of pr uh, private keys that already have some money, right? Because with Ethereum, we need money to actually tra send transactions. So the repository also contains private keys that you can just use. Mm, I think it's... So is Ethereum essentially an app that sort of simulates Ethereum on the uh, It doesn't simulate it. It, oh, it wraps around the Go Ethereum binary. Okay. Uh, it, it uses Go Ethereum as a library. So we right. set up the entire Go Ethereum stack okay. um, and just wrap the ABCI server around it. So you plug in Senderman as sort of the networking messaging. Yeah. yeah, so we turn up all the peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, functionality for Ethereum and we disable proof of work by just using yeah. a fake proof of work. Okay, all right. Um, so it seems that I already have... Oh, right, I used the wrong one. CD go path. Um, CP keys to into Ethermin demo. Uh, let's see if this worked. Ethermin demo. This looks good. Yes. So this should work. Um, so now we can actually start Ethermin by saying data idea. And yeah, this is now a longer command where I'm not going to unlock some of the keys. So I don't want unlock. I even know I might want to unlock it. Um, all right, no unlock, never mind. Okay. Yeah, so now it can't find the tenement instance that's on the running for some reason. Let's see why. Tenement. Oh, right, because tenement doesn't use the node. No, it does. Yeah, but so normally over. Oh, right. Never mind, of course. Wrong data directory. Element node, live coding that. Yes, so this is what you expect. So initially, now Tenement is trying to connect to the ABCI server, so to the application server that can receive like initialized messages. And as you can see, they're failing because our Ethermint instance isn't actually running. So once we start Ethermint, this wasn't supposed to happen. This might be. Okay, yeah, so initially, uh, uh, these are always fun errors, where this is one of the hard parts behind Ethermint, because if you initialize Ethereum, you already end up initially with um, a state. So initially, your state root isn't empty for Ethermint. Um, so you have to tell Tenement about it, and I don't know why this doesn't work right now. Am I? All right, because I'm in the wrong data directory here. You should only type commands from scratch, guys. Yes, so now you can see here, uh, before it goes away, uh, you can do it either way. Um, wait, can you say it again? It's trying to connect to four six six five eight on the machine. Um, uh, both the version of compiled as well as the binary that I got. Right. Um, where are you running? Uh, no, the, so here you're running in a sorry, kind of a, um, yeah, that's that's what I'm running. Not running. All right, so this error means the application isn't running right now. So if you open the second terminal, uh, you think you're running at the same time. So, you, yeah, that's also the important part. Uh, to run Ethermint, you have to have at least two terminal windows. One running Tenement and one running the application. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, so now we just we just remove this. So because we don't want to no uh, just run like this. Now it's done. Now it's listening for connections. And now it's connected also to Tenement. And now it's switching to Tenement, you should also see what uh, yeah. there you go. Okay, so um, that's what I mentioned earlier. Before it was one process that you had to run to get Ethernet up and running. Now it's two. Um, the cool thing is that it supports all the standard Go Ethereum tooling. So you can have your Mist wallet UI on top of it. You can have Geth attaching to it. Anything that supports either the IPC connections towards Go Ethereum or the RPC connections towards Go Ethereum works. So you can use Truffle to deploy your smart contracts and everything. So, any questions? Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. I hope you got something out of this. Um, if you have questions afterwards, after the session, or like to learn more, um, just hit me up on GitHub or Twitter. Uh, you can find my information somewhere here. Or send me an email. Um, I'm always looking for to get more people involved. Um, be that that you want to write your own ABCI app, and you need help with that, or that you want to run Ethermint. Like right now, the process of getting Ethermint up and running isn't the most straightforward. Um, so we need more people to try out, because from the dev team, we've all figured it out by now. So it's very hard to improve the process. Um, but yeah, if you have questions, just let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you.